This week in Flying Through Time, we'll be looking at some of the planes that set in motion a very distinguished manufacturing and aircraft design giant. One of these masterpieces was the only American fighter to remain in production throughout the entire Second World War. During the 1930s, the fledgling American aircraft company Lockheed had developed a series of technically advanced but not economically successful airliners. The economic pressures of the Depression were still being felt and commercial sales were fiercely competitive. Kelly Johnson first came to the Lockheed company in 1933 and was hired as only the sixth engineer of the developing company. He'd come to the notice of company engineers when he was supervising the wind tunnel testing of the company's Electra at the University of Michigan. As a 23-year-old engineering student, Kelly amazed Lockheed by first spotting and then correcting the stability issues in their twin-engine Lockheed Electra. His solution was the distinctive twin tail that would become a Lockheed signature on a number of subsequent models. With the European world events fueling military growth, Lockheed undertook a revision of their Super Electra airliner to a military version as a navigation trainer and reconnaissance bomber. Luckily for the company, designs had already begun when the British Purchasing Commission arrived in the USA in the spring of 1938 looking for combat aircraft. The British Purchasing Commission was sufficiently impressed that Lockheed was invited to send a delegation to London for further negotiations with the Air Ministry. To meet the British concerns regarding the crew placement and armament, Kelly performed a 72-hour marathon redesign session to convert the Electra into the Model 14. Satisfied with Kelly's commitments on June 23, 1938, the Air Ministry agreed to order 200 model B-14Ls, which was soon renamed the Hudson. This was the largest order that had ever been placed in the U.S. during peacetime. In all, Lockheed went on to build 3,500 Hudsons for the U.K. In 1937, the year before the RAF commitment to the Hudson, the American Army Corps released a proposal for a high-altitude interceptor. The requirements were so extreme for the day that many companies chose not to enter the competition. These requirements were for a plane capable of doing 360 miles per hour at 20,000 feet and 290 miles per hour at sea level. The aircraft had to reach optimum altitude in six minutes and have an endurance of one hour at full throttle. Lockheed's reply was the twin-engined, twin-boomed Model 22. Johnson's initial concepts for the new fighter covered a range of configurations, but the Lockheed team finally decided on a scheme with twin booms to accommodate the engines, and with the pilot and armament in a central nacelle. Two supercharged 12-cylinder Allison V1710 engines were positioned in the booms. The original Allison engines failed to achieve even 1,000 horsepower, but with supercharging, they were to output an amazing 1,475 horsepower each. To eliminate the effect of torque, the propellers would rotate in opposite directions. Armament was to consist of four machine guns in the nose of the nacelle clustered around a cannon, and the design was one of the first to make use of tricycle landing gear. The Model 22 won the contract competition to develop a prototype for the fixed price of $163,000. In reality, the prototype would actually cost five times this amount. With the rollout of the prototype, the Model 22 was given the official fighter designation of XP-38. 
weeks after the rollout to raise public support, at the insistence of the commander of the U.S. Army Air Corps, the new P-38, with only six hours flying time, was set to break the Transamerica airspeed record. On February 11, 1939, the only P-38 in existence took off on the record attempt. The 2,490 miles was achieved in only seven hours and two minutes, including an hour for two refueling stops. Unfortunately, on final approach, the aircraft clipped a line of trees, crashed, and was destroyed. The Lockheed engineers regarded the loss of the aircraft as a serious setback, but it did have a beneficial side effect. On the basis of the record flight, the Air Corps was so impressed that they ordered 13 YP-38s in April 1939. If the XP-38 had not been destroyed, orders would not have been placed until the prototype had been thoroughly evaluated. This, in effect, rapidly sped up the production process. With the outbreak of war in Europe in September 1939 and the YP-38's maiden flight on the 16th of September, the Army ordered another 66 of the aircraft. This order was followed quickly with another 607 units. In June 1940, the British ordered 600 of these groundbreaking interception fighters and named them the Lightning distinguishing them from the American name of Atlanta. The English order was not, however, to use two critical components, the superchargers and the contra-rotating propellers. The British felt that as the aircraft were intended for medium altitude combat, the superchargers would not be needed. The requirement for only the use of right-handed engines was for commonality with the large numbers of Curtis Tomahawks they had on order. Lockheed engineers protested strongly against this decision and privately labeled the variant the castrated lightning. When the first three of the order were delivered, the performance was so poor that the rest of the order was canceled. However, the name P-38 lightning has gone down in aeronautic history. The Lightning's further development showed a number of shortcomings, primarily the issue of compressibility stall, the tendency of the controls to simply lock up in a high-speed dive, leaving the pilot no option but to bail out. The phenomena of compressibility was later found to be caused by shock waves forming when airflow over the wings reached transonic speeds and became turbulent. An Air Corps major named Signa Gilkey managed to stay with a YP-38 in a compressibility lockup, riding it out until he got to denser air, where he recovered using elevator trim. This feat led to experiments that eventually resolved the problem by installing dive recovery flaps under each wing in 1944 to restore lift and smooth the airflow enough to maintain control when diving at high speed. Kelly Johnson later recalled, I broke an ulcer over compressibility on the P-38 because we flew into a speed range where no one had ever been before, and we had difficulty convincing people that it wasn't the funny-looking airplane itself, but a fundamental physical problem. During the war, the Lightnings were deployed in all theatres throughout Europe. They were used extensively as bomber escorts and in ground attack missions. The Lightning's huge range now allowed for extended escort duty, something never before achieved because of the existing fighter's limited range. While the P-38s were not as agile as the Germans' impressive FW-190s and BF-109s, nothing matched the concentrated firepower, sheer speed and zoom climb abilities of the Lightning. The Luftwaffe pilots are supposed to have grudgingly christened them the Fork-Tailed Devils. <laughs> 
Luftwaffe pilots also quickly learned not to make head-on attacks on the P-38, since its concentrated firepower made such a tactic suicidal. Although not the best dogfighter, the P-38 was a formidable interceptor and attack aircraft, and in the hands of a good pilot, it could be extremely dangerous in air-to-air -air combat. The Axis airfields also came under attack as the Lightnings retained enough fuel range for extended ground attack missions as well. Many German planes were wrecked where they were most vulnerable, at their home bases. At just about the time the P-38 had evolved into its true potential as a fighter interceptor, it was pulled from frontline service in Europe and replaced by the P-51 with Merlin engines. It was still used extensively in the Pacific afterwards and was in fact in great demand there, much more so than its P-51 or P-47 siblings. The Lightning was ideally suited for the Pacific theater. It possessed a performance markedly superior to that of its Japanese opponents and a range significantly better than that of the P-39s, P-40s and P-47s currently available. Its twin engines offered an additional safety factor when operating over long stretches of water and jungle. The Lightning proved to be extremely rugged and could take a lot of battle damage and still keep flying. Missions lasting 9, 10, or even 12 hours became routine, and many damaged Lightnings were able to limp home on only one engine. The agility of the Lightning was inferior to that of its smaller single-engine Japanese opponents. But the use of appropriate tactics, for example the avoidance of dogfighting at low altitudes, and the use of fast diving attacks and zoom climbing, enabled the P-38 squadrons in the arena to achieve impressive results. Its focused firepower was even more deadly to lightly armored Japanese warplanes than to the Germans. Jiro Horikoshi, who headed the design team that built the Zero, wrote, the peculiar sound of the P-38's twin engines became both familiar and hated by the Japanese all across the South Pacific. Throughout the war years, many P-38 models developed from the initial XP-38 and YP-38A to the very impressive P-38L and M night fighter version. In all, almost 10,000 planes were produced with many variations. A training variant was required as the Lightning was vastly more powerful than the existing cadet trainers. In one model, a second cockpit was installed on the port boom to allow the trainee to experience the power of the Lightning. A more effective attempt was the piggyback concept. With the removal of the radio and the installation of a seating area behind the cockpit, the instructor or the trainee would sit behind the pilot and gain flight experience, so as not to be totally unprepared for the daunting power of the twin Allisons. Photo reconnaissance versions are usually given little recognition, but these outstanding aircraft had probably an equally important position as any of the other P-38s. As soon as a plane returned, the cameras were unloaded and the films developed. Many of the most important military decisions came from what was seen in these prints. These pilots would rely on the speed and camouflage of the Lightning to take pictures and film of their objectives. The planes themselves had all of their armaments removed to make room for the cameras. Specific paints were developed to aid in the hiding of the planes at altitude. The haze blue camouflage paint came to be well respected by the reconnaissance pilots. <laughs> 
Interestingly, these lightnings probably saved more lives and were decisive in more conflicts than any other plane during the war. The final major variant was to the night lightning configuration. Painted dead black with flash cones on the guns and a radar pod below the nose. A second cockpit was installed with a raised canopy behind the pilot's canopy for the radar operator. The headroom in the back cockpit was limited and distinctly uncomfortable. Even with all of the extra additions, the P-38M's performance was faster than the purpose-built Northrop P-61 Black Widow night fighter. The night lightning saw some combat duty in the Pacific towards the end of the war. Standard lightnings were even used as crew and cargo transports in the South Pacific. They were fitted with pods attached to the underwing pylons, replacing drop tanks or bombs that could carry a single passenger in a lying down position or cargo. The pods were also used in medical evacuations and could take one stretcher per pod. In the spring of 1940, at a development request of the U.S. Air Force, the next generation Lightning began to take place. A single-seat version was quickly abandoned, and the two-seat version went through a number of radical design changes, particularly with regards to engine fit. With the outbreak of the Pacific War in December 1941, the project stalled. The single XP-58 or chain lightning prototype finally flew on the 6th of June 1944 and was a substantially radical departure from the original P-38. Powered by two 24-cylinder Allison inline engines with 2,100 horsepower each, the XP-58 was to mount four 37mm fixed forward firing cannon and two remote control barbettes but in reality, no armament was ever fitted. By the time the prototype flew, the US Air Force had completely lost interest in the project. A second prototype was never completed, and the one flying example was scrapped after the war. The end of the war left the US Air Force with thousands of war-weary P-38s on their hands, rendered obsolete by the jet age. 50 late model Lightnings were provided to Italy and operated for several years, and a dozen were sold to Honduras. The others were put up for sale for 1,200 US dollars apiece, and the rest were scrapped. Lockheed test pilot Tony Levere, who later went on to test the record shattering F 104 Starfighter, was among those who came up with the money to buy a P 38 and run it as an air racer. Lockheed also continued using the Lightnings in their subsequent tests of other designs. During the 1950s, a number of P-38L Lightnings were used in the X-7 ramjet trials. The trials were used to test the viability of these extremely efficient engines for their future use in anti-aircraft missiles. The testing was then modified to that of the power plants themselves. The Lightnings were used to release scale models of the X-7s. These were Lockheed's first step into pilotless planes. This whole area of science was only in its formative years and almost every concept of these tests had to be invented. Because of the speed of the ramjets, even the parachute recovery systems had to be redesigned. Totally new concepts in radar and control systems also had to be devised. Everything in these tests was from a drawing board. The full-scale models seen here were later flown from Air Force bombers. In all, this test series flew over 130 flights. 
The X-7 craft themselves were extremely basic in some aspects. The best example of this is probably their landings. The reinforced nose sections were simply allowed to drive themselves vertically into the ground, leaving the attached body standing up so as to ease the relocation of the stricken craft for the retrieval crews. Aside from the X-7 craft themselves, Lockheed had to design the performance assessment equipment and processes that were to be used in the testing series. The results from the 61 Test X-7 series were craft that recorded the first flights at three, four, five, and six times the speed of sound. The top speed achieved was 2,881 miles per hour, and these were the first air-breathing full-scale research aircraft designed as a Mark III testbed. At the end of the war, with the accumulated fine-tuning of several years of operation, the P-38 was an amazing fighter by any consideration, though it has been overshadowed by the equally outstanding Thunderbolts and Mustangs. It could fly further at a greater height and carry much more payload than any other fighter. It was truly an exceptional plane.